of you have been through that. Many of you have, uh, have, have had friends, have had families that have been through that. There's no good way around this topic today. There, there, there is no great way to, to go about the issue of divorce, of, of adultery, of broken lives, broken families. We're going to approach this as gently as we can, amen? And, and we got to start with something lighthearted because I'm feeling the weight. I'm seeing some tears. So um, I want to tell you a little thing about the, that I heard this week. Speaking of adultery, there was a six-year-old boy and his dad that had just came from church, and the preacher was preaching on adultery. They're on their way home from church, and he says, Dad, i got a question. What's agriculture? And he said, uh, Son, let me just tell you this. Don't ever get caught plowing in another man's field. You can laugh in church. I was clean, by the way, sanctified through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Man, this is this is going to be awkward, and there really is. Uh, there's no way around it. But how many people know when Jesus speaks, He means it. And when the red letters talk, we talk with it. We we agree with it here. We honor God. We're going to talk today about some tough topics, some tough issues, and ultimately, man's greatest need is this. Guess what? It's to fall on forgiveness only God can give. But you have to come to a spot to where you understand, I need that forgiveness. That's for me. I need that grace. I need that mercy. So ultimately, we're going to start, as we always do, with the fact that God loves us, He forgives us, and He wants to have a relationship with us through Jesus Christ. And we're going to end with the same thing. So heads up. Okay? Heads up, chins up, hopes up. It's going to be fun, interesting, and people are going to blush. All right? So our second week, second week of our Why Marriage series, and at the end, we're going to give a really cool takeaway about why marriage each week, because how many people know we need to show the world that God loves marriage? God is into marriage. God ordained it. It was God's plan. It was God's thing. And as followers of God, followers of Christ, we need to ultimately reflect God's love in all that we do. Amen? Amen. And this is one of those tough subjects. So today's, uh, today's title is 4D Marriage. 4D Marriage. And no, we're not handing goggles out at the door so you can see me all bubblehead or whatever those 3D movies do, okay? This is a fourth dimension. This is God's dimension. This is God's view on what marriage is. There's four Ds that are going to pop up today. And each one, some of them are going to be awkward, some of them are going to be easy, okay? But ultimately, you and I, we all, everybody in this room, we all need to agree on one thing, okay? God is the one in control here. This is God's ship. He wrote the book. It's not changing. We don't get to add to it. It says it. We do it. Amen? Amen. Take away today's message on the inside of your, uh, your things there. God makes it. Man misuses it. And God mends it. Your failure will never be final as long as you believe in forgiveness. Is anybody thankful today for a forgiving and loving God? Is anybody thankful that when we fail, he never does? Psalm 118.8. Is anybody thankful that we can put our hope, trust, and confidence and assurance of this eternal plan because there was a real Jesus sent to a real earth for a real problem called sin that needed to be addressed? He dealt with it. It's been done. We need to receive it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just, uh, first and foremost, God, we pray for the people that, that, that just didn't show up today because they knew where we were heading. They felt the awkwardness. And for the people that are here in the middle of the awkwardness, God, sort this mess out to us. This is a tough subject. We need your help, God. There's no way around it. We need your help today. We want to know what you think. We want to hear your thoughts. Ultimately, we want to land on your forgiveness, your love, your grace, and your mercy. And we want to know one thing this morning, God. Every person in here, we came for one reason, to know you love us and you sent your son for us. And today we all collectively agree that we do know that. That is there. That's an option. Make it real. Make it known in the hearts and minds of everybody here so that we would all go out here changed, affected, and be ready to be used for your glory. In Jesus' name and all God's people said. 
All right, so we got an issue going on. You guys been here last week? We got an issue going on, okay? These religious leaders, they came up to Jesus like they always do, and they tried trapping him with this tough question, right? Hey, teacher, hey, man, what, what do you think? What's the deal with divorce? What, what's going on? Is there such a thing as a no-fault divorce? Everybody goes home happy, and it just is what it is. Can there just be a wide-out section on that certificate of marriage? Is there an option? Help me find the door. Don't nudge your spouse when I say stuff like that, by the way. And we could look at that and we could think, you idiots. Why would you, you know, obviously they're trying to trap him, right? But also we got to understand too, things were a lot different than they are now. Okay? For these people, okay, for the Jewish, they actually did believe in no-fault divorce. There were two schools of thoughts on it. There was a conservative side, and there was a liberal side, just like today. Today, we find ourselves with a conservative Jesus who's got a lot to say on this issue. And, and if you're in here, and you've been divorced, you're thinking divorce, or, or you, you're going to get divorced someday, whatever the case may be, hear me on this, please. We always carry our mess to the next destination. Plan B shouldn't be called destination. It should be called mestination. Because when we fail, like we all do, everybody in here has failed in one way, shape, or form because you came to the acknowledgement that I'm a sinner and I need grace. Amen? We all, this morning collectively, can I tell you what this looks like? It's a big pile of mess. Everybody in here, and God loves us. God thinks we're beautiful. Don't hear me wrong on this, okay? We all brought baggage in this door this morning. Each one of us. Hurts, habits, hang-ups in life, addictions, struggles. Every person in here has these things. Why? Because we have a sinful nature that opposes the Spirit of God. And you're in here this morning. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is to say, that ain't for me. I don't need that. Because every word is inspired that we read from the Spirit of God. As we apply it to our life, we find the favor and the blessing of God when we live in the boundaries and parameters of God. Amen? Amen. So here we go. Let's go. First thing that you need to know if you're taking notes this morning, if we are going to have successful marriages, they must start off with a successful view on who God is. You know the Bible talks about being equally yoked, yes? yes? And there's a reason, right? Because it's important that both people come into the, the, the relationship and come into the covenant knowing one thing. We're both flawed people. You aren't making me happy all the time. I'm not making you happy all the time. And we ultimately, we got to put our junk somewhere for somebody that can handle it. Two sinful people come together in this thing called marriage and if they don't have a savior, they got a pile of sin and messes they always work with. And, and, and by the way, how you view God is how you treat others. You know that, right? If you believe, how many people in here believe God is forgiving? Forgiving is easy then. How many people in here believe God is love? Anybody believe God is love? Loving comes easy. And how many people in here believe that God is mercy? God shows mercy. God shows. We show these things because in the believer's life, the Bible is over and evident with it that we need to be displaying the spiritual characteristics of who we believe God is. Amen? And if you don't know who God is, if you don't know about God, if you guys don't agree on this issue of God, you're going to come into this marriage thing and you're going to find yourself over and over again in turmoil. Why? Because there's no forgiveness, there's no love, there's no grace, there's bitterness, nastiness, resentment, record of wrongs, what you did last week, what you did last month, what you did last year, what you did before we even knew each other. Ultimately, the Bible says... Matthew 6, 14 and 15, Jesus talking, he said, how you forgive is how you'll be forgiven. Do you want forgiveness? Because I do. Amen? So we get going here, and the next thing you see, the most destructive thing in marriage, what is it? False expectations. Your spouse doesn't know what your brain's thinking. 
Nobody knows what your brain's thinking. Can I tell you some good news? You don't even know what your brain's thinking. Our brain is a battlefield, okay? Our thoughts play tricks on us. There are times where people come in my office and they're both mad at each other and by the time they get in there, they don't even know why. Well, I thought it was because of this, but really it was because six months ago, amen? That doesn't fly in God's eyes. You deal with the issue, you choose to forgive, you live to love, and you learn to serve, and it works out, amen? We've got to be forgiving people. We've got to be people that build realistic expectations. My spouse will not meet my expectations. Right? Why? Because they're not God. They don't know what I'm thinking. They don't know why I'm thinking it. They don't know that hurt my feelings until I can communicate it. What happens in expectation? We expect this and it goes right here, right? And then what sets in? Disappointment. We're disappointed now. Now we're angry. Now we're upset because I expected this ungodly task of you. You didn't perform it. And now who comes in? Satan. Look into what? John 10. John 10, 10. Kill, steal, and destroy, right? He's trying to snatch marriages up. He's trying to snatch people up. He's trying to tear things apart day in, day out. He will give you every opportunity to run to the open door sign. Why? Because Satan destroys what God unites. He doesn't like it. Why two are better than one? Why? Because unity is God's rule. Ephesians 4, you know what it says? It says, do everything you can to keep unity. God's plan has always been and will always be unity amongst people. Amen? Always. It's just the way it goes. We must learn to see everything, next thing on your notes, in 4D. So what are these 4Ds? Is everybody ready? Are we good? Thumbs up? Everybody thumbs up? Nobody wants to kill me yet? All right. All right, here we go. Pharisees came, asked Jesus the question, what can we do to get this divorce? Jesus goes back to the beginning, right? And he quotes Genesis 2.24. A man's going to leave his father and mother. The two are going to become one flesh. And then, guess what? God joins. Nobody's going to separate, okay? They're male and female, okay? It's one marriage, one man, one woman for a lifetime, okay? So the first thing in Matthew 19.6, we're going to see right here, number one, the first D, God's design is one and done. God's design is one and done. And you're thinking in here, I've been divorced, I'm leaving. No, you, you just need to stay because it'll get, there's always forgiveness, amen? Thank God. God's design is one and done. What does he say here? He says in, in Matthew 19, 6, so they are no longer two, but they're one flesh. Therefore, what God, how many people know God does the wedding? The preacher doesn't do the wedding. The, the coroner doesn't do the wedding. Whoever you choose to do your wedding, they don't do the wedding. The, the, the God in heaven joins us as two, right? Joins two as one, sorry. And God joins it, and man's not to separate. It says it right there. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. So we see there God's picture, God's design is one and done. One and done. Second D, marriage destruction. Destruction occurs in the hard heart. Has anybody ever had somebody ask him a really dumb question? Like there was no point, you just wasted my time and yours by asking me that, right? When you're looking at this question, the Pharisees are about ready to ask him in Matthew 19, 7, if you're Jesus, you got a lollipop called Dum Dum flashing in your head right now. Because he's gonna say they're gonna they're gonna say something that invalidates the whole question. In Matthew 19, 7 says it right here, it says, Why then, they asked him, did Moses command us to give divorce papers and to send her away? Well, if you don't know the Bible, if you're in here today, if this is the first time you've ever heard it, I got news for you. God never commands divorce. Not once in scripture will he say, You should do this. He says, You may under these grounds. It's never recommended. Why? Because anytime you separate something God has joined, pain is involved. There's always pain. I don't care if it's you. I don't care if it's me. I don't care if it's the next guy. We need to detach ourselves from God's perfect love, God's perfect plan, and we jump on plan B. You got pain going on. 
I've seen some of you guys, when you're watching that video, comforting each other even, probably tears in your eyes welling up. That's a painful experience. By God's grace, how many people know it's by God's grace? We don't go there. By God's grace, he keeps us as we walk with him. By God's grace, God's grace alone. If you're married today, if, if you know that your woman, if you know that your man have put up with a lie with you, it's a great day to just say, thanks, babe. Yeah. He knows. <laughs> Jesus says, though, in, in Matthew 19, 8, I love how he responds, but before we get to his response, there's two words that will help you guys figure out what's going on here with these Pharisees. This is not a band instrument, by the way. The ketubah. Okay, if you go home and you say, hey, honey, can we play the ketubah? You're, you're playing a prenuptial agreement, basically. <laughs> it was an agreement that Jewish people would make when they'd come together, and they'd, they'd go down a checklist of things. How are we going to raise the kids? What do we want for our life? What are some terms you could agree to? What can I agree to? How many people know you should probably talk about these things before you get married? Right? If it's the end in mind, if it's one and done in mind, you need to know the person you're marrying. And best of all, you need to know that they're not capable probably of meeting all your needs and wants and wishes all the time. And so what would happen with the ketubah along the line is as people, as we're going to get into in this Deuteronomy passage, there was only two ways that these people knew of divorce. Are you ready? Two times divorce came up in their law, in their book. you ready? Number one is if you're raped... The person that does it can't divorce you. You're bound for life. Well, that's a pretty weird divorce clause. We don't talk about that one in the church. I know, right? And the second one, you know what it is? It was the Deuteronomy 24 passage. If any, if any man finds something displeasing of his wife, let him send her away. Well, you can imagine a liberal man that's wanting to get out is saying, displeasing, displeasing, and he's looking for ways out, Amen. But Jesus is saying here clearly as we go along, if you're looking for ways out, you never thought about who brought you in. You never thought about God's plan. You never thought about God's will. You never thought about your family's best interest. You never thought about the dynamics of the ripple effect as you go along in life. Can I share with you guys just some quick divorce statistics? If you're wondering, okay, here we go, ready? Divorce dramatically increases these things. Hypertension, early death, Strokes, respiratory or intestinal cancer. It is only slightly less dangerous. Not even statistically, not even numerically, not even percentilely. It's only slightly less dangerous, divorce for your health, than smoking one or more packs of cigarettes a day. It harms mental health. It leads to depression. It leads to anxiety. It even leads towards suicide. White males that are in a divorce have a four time higher suicide rate. And everybody loses. Here's the bad news. Everybody loses. Let's talk about kids from divorced parents. Anybody in here been, been through a divorced home? Let's, let's talk about you guys really quick. Here's the chances in your life to flow from them. You're four times more likely to divorce. You're four times more likely of a violent crime. What? You're 80% more likely to live in poverty. You have a dramatic increase. I'm talking high 90 percentile of some sort of sexual promiscuity. Is that alarming to anybody? Are these stats alarming to anybody? You, you're two times more likely to be incarcerated at a young age. You go around to the juvenile facilities and you ask them, hey, where's mom and dad? You're highly more likely to drop out and get pregnant at a young age. Yeah, the, 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 the effects of marriage, the emotional effect, it leads to a hard heart. I don't care who you are. You know, what, you know what builds a hard heart? Bad experiences. Nobody's ever got divorced for a good experience, have they? I never read about one. Hey, we were going along great. We just decided it'd be best when we got divorced. It was fun. Everybody won. You never hear about that, do you? It just doesn't happen. The emotional effects of hard heart, bitterness, anger, depression, these are stats. I'll let the health experts speak. The physical effects, are you ready? It leads to sexual immorality. It leads to sexual immorality. We're going to get there today. The spiritual effect, you ready? It blocks forgiveness. 
Not just towards others, but to yourself. Why? Because as you get hurt, you shut down in life, you build walls, your heart gets hard, you get callous, and sin, baseline, bottom dollar, it separates us from the love of God. I see some of you guys just looking at me like a deer in the headlights, and here's what I'm going to say to you. There's healing only at the cross. If you think some person's going to make it right, if you think me preaching good things, fuzzy things is going to make it right, nothing's going to make it right. You getting on your face and crying out to a holy God, forgive me, heal me, and cleanse me, that will be a great beginning. Because there is forgiveness, there is healing, and there is grace at the cross of Jesus Christ. Well, now that the floodgates are open, Jesus says right here, he says clearly, The whole reason Moses ever allowed divorce was because hearts get hard. If you're taking notes. Deuteronomy 24.1, here's where that law comes from, by the way. If a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something improper about her, he may write her a divorce certificate, hand it to her, and send her away from his house. If you go on and you read verses 2 through 4, you know what it's going to tell you? Here's what it's going to tell you. If, If she goes and marries another person, don't remarry her. I don't know if you would. I don't know how that, I don't know. But basically, the same problem that separates you, it's still going to be there. Okay? And, and what he's saying here, by the way, he's talking to the liberals, the people that say, and this is true. Okay, you ready for this? Talmud. Okay, the Talmud. You know, does everybody know what that is? It's a Jewish text. It's what, okay, so here we go. The Talmud would tell you if you looked at divorce. Here's reasons why people get divorced, all right? Jewish culture. Bitterness and strife. Leaf, be done. She burnt supper. Don't even point to your wife right now. She's got wrinkles appearing underneath her eyes. I know. Thank God for Jesus, right? Are you ready for this one? It says this. People would believe this in the Jewish culture. I did a lot. I studied this one hard this week because I couldn't believe this one. Fact. Even up to the point if you find another person more attractive, leave. This is who he's talking to right now. And can I tell you at the root of what he's talking to here, here's the root of what he's talking to, here's the root of what we talk to every week, here's the root of everything you'll see in society. Is your heart going to allow Jesus in or isn't it? That's the question today. Your heart's going to block your salvation if you let it. Why? Because the heart is deceitfully wicked and corrupt. Follow your heart means follow to hell. Sorry. Because your heart soaks in what your mind gravitates towards, and what you think comes out in what you say, and what you say you take in your ears, and it gravitates back down into your heart. You want to know a true fact about marriage? What you say you'll get. That'll change how you talk to your spouse. You talk to them harshly, what are you going to get in return? You talk to them in love, what are you going to get in return? So hearts get hard. Let's talk about that hard-hearted business, right? Ephesians 4.31, right here, going to be on the screen. 4.31 and 32 gets even better, but Ephesians 4.31, if you're taking notes, tells us to remove bitterness. Are you ready for this? All bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander must be removed from you along with all malice, okay? Must be removed. Is everybody seeing that? Most translations will say get rid of it. Now, if I came up to you right now and I told you to get rid of something, you're going to throw it in the trash, aren't you? Why? Because you realize it's junk. Bitterness is the devil's junk that we drink every day, hoping it hurts somebody else, but it tears us up the whole time. We hold on to things. We don't forgive things. We keep reflecting on things. This is bitterness. A man said this week, I was talking to him, and he said, you know, bitterness is a lot like vines. You can't just spray it. There's no miracle treatment. you got to go into the heart and dig them roots up. you got to find out where it came from. What happened young in your age? What happened in your childhood? What happened early on in life? What you've taken in will be different out in how you treat your spouse. Amen? Amen? Bitterness is nasty. Bitterness is ugly. Bitterness has killed every marriage in America. Jesus says it here. Moses allowed it. He didn't command it, but he knew why. Because your hearts were so hard. Has anybody ever been talking to an unwilling person that you know they're just set in their ways? Nothing I say is going to even help. 
And it's painful. Why? Because over time, a person has allowed that system of belief in their head. And I'm telling you here this morning, if you can think of somebody that's wronged you that you need to forgive, if you need to think of a painful experience, you need to cry these things out and you need to get over them. Choosing to hold on to bitterness is choosing to hold on to Satan's hand. Get rid of it. Kill it. Be done with it. It was a horrible experience. It was a traumatic experience. It was rough. It was painful. Go through the process, right? What's the process? James tells us to process. What are we supposed to do for healing? Confess our sins to one another. Wait a minute. I'm going to God for healing and people to forgiveness. It's backwards. You go to people for healing and God to forgiveness. Why? Because something got fractured between us and now my spirit's off. You know that you can't have conflict and be right with God, right? Is everybody good with that in here? Because God, what, what's the message of God? God is love. God is endless love. God is endless mercy. God is endless grace. God forgives as soon as we confess it. And as followers of Christ, I'm telling you in here, listen to what I'm about to say. You don't have a choice. We forgive the unforgivable. We love the unlovable. And we live to show the love of God in all that we do. Amen? Hebrews 12, 15 says it like this. He, or Ephesians 4, 32, first it seemed better, right? And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just like God forgave you. Has anybody in here been forgiven? Amen. Is that freeing? Yes. Let somebody else know. Show it to somebody else. Show them what you've experienced. Show them the love. Hebrews 12, 15, if you're taking notes, says that when bitterness springs up, it defiles many. I love the first few words of this. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God. How many people in here should fall short of the grace of God? How many? Everybody shout it out like there's an answer on the board, maybe? How many people in here should leave here falling short of the grace of God? Nobody, there should be nobody that ever walks through our doors for any period of time that does not find the love, the grace, and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in their lives. As followers, you and I, we have a responsibility. As husbands and wives, we have the same responsibility. Show her God's love. Show him God's love. Not your love because your love is flawed and that's going to come out, that's going to be a part of it. But when they fail, when they fall, because they will, because we're humans, and when you do, ultimately land on this. If God forgives it, so do I. If God forgives it, so do I. The second half of that Hebrews 12, 15 says, and that no root of bitterness springs up. You see that root again? Because it's looking to grow in people's hearts. It's looking... The heart. Isn't God always about the heart? He wants in. He wants access. And when these roots start growing up... Has anybody in here ever tried to plant a beautiful garden and you keep getting weeds? It's hard to work through and it's frustrating. And it wears you out and it's taxing. Some of us in this room today, you have weeds that need to be pulled out that aren't helping you one bit. It's been done. It's over with. You can't take it back. They can't take it back. Forgive it. Move forward and live how God's called us to live. Love. Endlessly. This is no root of bitterness springs up causing trouble by it. You guys seeing this? How many people believe bitterness causes trouble? How many people believe misery loves company? You ready for the next, the next words? Defiling many. Isn't it funny that bitter people always know who to hang out with? Bitter people. Misery loves company. And sometimes, how many people have ever had this happen? Somebody comes around and they start speaking and they change your way of thinking. And they get you on the negative plan B mentality. Bitterness defiles everybody involved, and it cannot be forgiven, it can't be healed, it can't be dealt with, until ultimately we come to the fact of, I'm pulling these roots up, and I'm choosing to love like God. I choose heaven, 
not hell. I choose blessing, not cursing. I choose forgiveness, not bitterness. I choose grace. I choose, he choose healing. I choose truth. I choose a life of love like God loves me. Amen? Some of you guys are like, I don't know. I choose to be angry at my spouse today. We'll get, we'll get over that, hopefully. So let's get a definition of bitter. Bitter, if you're taking notes, is defined as angry, hurt, or resentful because of one's I put that in capitals for a reason, right? Bad experiences. That's the definition. Bitterness can always be traced to bad experiences. Divorce is traced to a bad experience. Problems, sexual immorality, all of it's traced back to a bad experience. And bad experiences breed bitterness. Bitterness brings a problem in our heart. Bitterness flows out in others. Then by, before we know it, everybody in the household is defiled by this cancer called bitterness. This sickness called bitterness. Man, if I was leading my household, if I was leading anybody's household in this room, I'd call a collective meeting and say, what junk needs to go? Because we need to be done with it. We need to squash it, not let Satan have any more foothold. Let's choose to forgive them. Let's choose to love them. Let's choose to live like Christ because one day we don't answer to these people. We answer to God. Next thing on your notes, the third D. Divorce is destiny, being future. Is always plan B with pain from plan A. That's where divorce heads. At some time, you'll have to crawl through the same hurdle again. The same problem will come up. The same issue will come up again. The same thing, but why? Because you have a bad experience you went through. It wasn't the way you wanted it to go. It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. And when I was 16 and I was listening to I Love Lucy's remix on my iPod, I don't even know if that exists. But they didn't tell me marriage looked like that and divorce was going to happen and all these things. It wasn't how I planned it to go. Sin wasn't how God planned our life to go either. But decisions were made. A choice was made one day to maybe look too long at that website. Maybe to start lusting after that woman that gave you a little bit more attention than your wife. That coworker, that person that just understood you, that got me so much better. And maybe some damage has been done. God heals. God forgives. God wants nothing more for you to cry it out to him because the word says in Psalm 34, 18, you know what God does? He draws near to those crushed in spirit. He wants to wrap his arm around every lie that has broken your trust, everything that has happened in your life. God has a plan to heal it at the cross. Amen? Some of the best marriages I know are from divorced people or from, from families of infidelity. Can I tell you how marriages get great? Put God in them. Put God's love in it. Live like Jesus. Matthew 19.9 says it like this. And I tell you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Whoever divorces his wife, so he answers that question back to Deuteronomy 24, remember? So what's that, what's that impleasing thing? What, what's that displeasing that I can send my wife, send my spouse away for? He says sexual immorality that does constitute, but by the way, he never says you should do it. Are we tracking? Did Jesus ever say, hey, you should get a divorce? Does divorce hurt? It does. It causes damages. It wrecks lives. Statistics show. But guess what? Can I tell you what statistics also show? 100% of people that we see come in contact with Jesus in the Bible are forever changed. They're forever healed. They're forever right. So all of a sudden, Jesus has kind of turned the cards. and He says, well, you can do this. Anybody ever, ever have a dog that made them mad? What's the first thing you yell? Get! That's a Jewish term too. Do you know? Do you, do you know what the get is? Do you know what that is? Anybody guessing? Around the room? 
this is your way out. This is the divorce certificate. If we've went through this and we get to this, Jesus says, it's not God's plan. God's plan was one and done. It's going to lead into destruction. It's going to hurt lives. You're going to be on plan B trying to find your way back to plan A. But he doesn't leave us with that. And I love scripture so much because here's where God always leaves us. Are you ready? That fourth D. The third D is divorce is destiny. The second D was marriage destruction. The first D was God's design. And the last D with the worship team coming up, God's delight. God's delight is that we would come to allow his forgiveness to override all of our failures to give us a fresh beginning. Is everybody good with that this morning? Can we collectively land on the fact that God sent his son for sin? Yes. And we've sinned, haven't we? Yes. God's delight is that we would come to his law, his forgiveness, to override all our failures, to give us a fresh beginning, okay? Here we go. What's been done? What hasn't been done? What's failed you? What's let you down? What's still brewing on the inside? What happened? What do you need healing in? You know, I was talking to a guy the other day, and it was just so divine. It was one of them God things. Anybody like when God sends people into your life to speak to you? Was at my, uh, my wife's, my nephew's. It was my wife's brother and his wife. They have two kids. Had a, had a birthday party. We were out there, never met the family before. And so you guys can imagine, as a quiet person I am, I walk up to everybody and I just throw it out. Hey, what kind of deodorant you guys use? What's your name, by the way? Start meeting people. Met this one gentleman in his upper 60s. We ended up talking for a while afterwards. He came to me and he says, you know, I would guess when I first met you that you're like a pastor. He said, I got mistake for that a lot too in business. I go on trips. And he said, there's something about you that's just comfortable with yourself. And I looked him dead in the eyes and I'm saying the same thing I'm saying to you this morning. I realize how big of a screw-up I am and how awesome God is. You couldn't embarrass me with my sin because my sin's already been paid for. We got to talking. Turns out he was a very successful businessman. He goes through his career with me. He was in HR. He hired people and fired people. And, and he was a really, really, anybody ever, these enlightening men that we need to soak up wisdom from, like the Bible says? He says, there was five golden rules, but I shortened it down to three. And these are the three things that he said to me. These are my three golden rules in life. Number one, I treat everybody like they're my mother and father. That way I don't have to worry about disrespecting or treating somebody poorly. I love them. All of them. Even the person that makes me so mad, I love them. He said, my second golden rule was I always embraced failure like a long-lost friend because I understood people don't want to follow a leader that's afraid to fail. People want to follow a leader that says, I fail, he doesn't. If you're in here and you have insecurities of failure, you've been hiding your failures, fess up to your mess up and get cleaned up. God loves you. And he said the third thing, the third thing that I found so meaningful in my life. I always invited criticism because it would always make me grow in the end. And here's what I'm saying to you this morning. Maybe you've been through a lot. Maybe you're in here and you're thinking, I'm the best husband, I'm the best wife, I am the cat's meow. You might be thinking anything right now. You know, as we talk about who's a, who's a better wife, who's a better husband, it reminds me of the story of these two guys arguing, all right? They're two married guys. Go figure. They, they're on lunch one day, and they're, they're taking out their bitterness on each other. No. And they're arguing. They're saying, what's the difference between complete and finished? You say complete, sis. I say it's that. You say, okay. So one guy finally takes it for He says, okay, here it is. 
If you marry the right woman, you'll be complete. If you marry the wrong woman, you'll be finished. But if the right one catches you with the wrong one, you're going to be completely finished, buddy. <laughs> Is anybody thankful today that we have a God that loves us, that forgives the unforgivable, loves the unlovable, and washes us in grace? Why marriage? Here it is. It gives us a new dimension of God's vision of love, forgiveness, healing, and grace. It gives us God's vision of what love is. Choosing to love the unlovable, choosing to forgive the unforgivable, and ultimately going to a maker of us all for healing that only he could provide as we live in the love and the unity and the commitments that we've tied ourselves to. Amen? So maybe you're in here today, and I'm talking to you a lot, and you're like, man, is he spying on me? Has he got creeper cam? No, but God does. And the Holy Spirit wants you. The Holy Spirit wants you to come to a place of acknowledgement where you say, God, I need you. Nobody else can do what you can do for me. Nobody else can love me like you love me. Nobody else can forgive me like nobody else can forgive me. You know, there's, a, there's an old Southern gospel song, and it's called, Can't Nobody Do Me Like Jesus. And I'm saying the same thing this morning. I was driving across town heading here this morning, and I promise you, not audibly, but in my spirit, this is what I felt. Only Jesus can do what you need done. I'm speaking to myself. And if there's one thing I can save you singles from doing, the sexual immorality catches up to you. You get married, you tie it down one day, you enter into a bond, it breaks fellowship that God wants. It hinders intimacy. It took me over a year to get to a healthy spot with my wife. And I am a li I, hey, guess what? I'm the biggest sinner here, okay? And here's what I'm saying to you guys, because we all sin, we all fall short of the glory of God. I'm a living testimony that God heals the deepest hurts and he wants to do the same for you the question is today will you let him everybody's head bowed everybody's eyes closed maybe you're in here today and you're just broken man that's me I don't know if I trust my spouse. I don't even know what's going on with my spouse. I don't even know if I'm ever going to have a spouse. I just feel hopeless. I feel abandoned. We know that all that stuff comes from the pit, and God is a God of hope. God is a God of future. God is a God of love. And God is a God that loves us so much that he sent his son for us. Maybe you're in here and you're feeling hopeless. You're feeling helpless. You're feeling discouraged. Maybe you have some sin that's been confronted in your life, and you'd say, Pastor, right now, I want to invite the Holy Spirit to do something in me. God doesn't move without our obedience. God requires our obedience at a certain level to set in, to allow his grace to flood us. If that's you, could I just see your hand? And you'd say, I've had some stuff cut in. I've got some poor feelings. I've got some things going on in my head. And don't be ashamed. Nobody's looking around. You'd say, you hit a nerve today. I see some hands. And I choose to forgive today. I choose to allow Jesus Christ to come into me and help me with this. You know what God did with your head bowed, your eyes closed, you can lower your hands. You guys hear this every week, but what God did is he loved you so much that he gave you a free pass into eternity. He sent his son to do something none of us could do, to rectify the sins of the world, to wash over us, to forgive us, and to love us and cleanse us. God sent his son so that we could have fellowship with him again, and you need to be saved to enter into heaven. If you think good deeds, good person, any of this stuff matters in the end, it doesn't. So if you're in here and you've never said, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life, 
I want to have a relationship with you. Now is the perfect time to do it. I believe you died for me. I believe you were buried in my place. I believe you were resurrected to show me I could be forgiven and set right with God the Father. You are the only way into heaven. John 14, 6. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except for through him. If you're in here, you're hurt, you're helpless, you're broken, and you've never prayed this prayer, today is day one. Let's pray. Father, you sent your son because you love us. I ask for healing in our congregation, in our body of believers. God, you want to heal us. You want to cleanse us. You want to set us free. And God, ultimately, your vision for our life is your love. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We all fail. Whatever the failure is, maybe there's people in here, sexual immorality. Maybe it's people in here that are lusting. Maybe there are people in here that have been divorced. Whatever the issue, God, you forgive it all freely when we ask for your forgiveness. So today we come to you and we ask you, God, forgive us. Make us right. Cleanse us. Wash us like new. Let us be in your presence daily, nightly, Father. Let us reflect on good things, your love, your grace, your mercy, and forgiveness. I pray that bitterness would leave. And I pray that each person in here would come to the point to where we say, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus, you died for us. You were buried and you resurrected. And all who believe that and all who say Jesus is Lord, the scripture says if we say it with our mouth and we believe it in our heart, we will be saved. Help people today to find salvation, to find grace, to find healing. And bless the givers, God, because you blessed us first. Let us bless you back, Father. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. And all God's people screamed.